welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, this is pretty exciting thing for me to share today. Um, so I guess uh, maybe to start the the IQ OS, uh, um, as you know, is um, our operating system. You know how we get work done, and at the foundation is principles that guide. You know, like the compass that guides our decision. Then and, and and then in after the principles are our practices, like the strategic practices, and within those practices we've got a a series of processes, and then above that sits just the architecture and how we organize ourselves. And this, uh, what we're gonna, uh, what I guess what I'm gonna be sharing today is um, our decision-making process. What we had before was taken, um, you know, kind of a hybrid from what we saw in Holacracy and this other um, process uh, th that we liked in self-management called the advice process, but it never sat with me well, like it's always like just this, so much war. So, and, and then I, I, so I've been wanting to make a new decision-making process. This is one of the weak points in the operating system. I think, you know, we're evolving it. We, you know, um, you know, there's one other area that I know needs to get addressed, but this was really a big one. And I've been wanting to make some changes here for some time. So this is my attempt at an ontology for decision-making and, um, you know, in doing this, I looked at other systems and a lot of, you know, they, you know, like HBR, they just kind of focus in on the problem. And, and, uh, and then I also reflected back on, you know, like, I think the, the biggest part in creating this was me reflecting back to the big decisions that I have made, uh, you know, in my life. And, you know, I went through them, small ones and big ones. And, and, you know, I was, you know, and of course, when you're looking backwards, you can reflect on it and go, wow, what did I, you know, like, what would I do differently this time? And so uh, that was was really uh, useful. So when you think too of self management, you know, one of the things about self management is that it's distributed authority, you know, we, we want people and teams to make their own decisions. So contrasting a traditional hierarchical um, organization that decisions are made by the top, and then the managers enact those decisions. So it's sort of a a cascading uh, down. So it's really, you know, important that um, we all help each other make better decisions and we all become better at making decisions. And, you know, to me, this is actually like a really, really important subject. So to start, I'm going to uh, take you uh, back on a story with me. I'm so I'm 24 years old and I have my business, which I, I had started. Uh, actually, when I was 18, I started as an install shop and it turned into a store and I stayed working at this steel mill and I'm doing both jobs and, and I'm like walking to work one morning. I'm exhausted and uh, sun's coming up and I'm walking towards a steel mill and I'm in my mind. It's um, I'm thinking, you know, geez, like this business thing is not it's not working. And, uh, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm just thinking, geez, like, you know, your experiment, you tried your experiment failed, you should shut it down and quit, uh, quit killing yourself. But so, so little did I know the feeling inside me was leading to an important decision uh, in my life. So introducing task decision-making process. So this is the, as I mentioned, this is the process I've actually been using. I've just really, really decoded it um, now. And so there's four steps to task. Uh, the first step is tension. The second is ask, then simulate. And the fourth uh, step is, is quotient. So let's go where it all begins. You feel attention. So attention is like energy. And you know, back to what I was feeling, I was feeling, you know, this tension, I was, you know, exhausted. And, um, you know, I'm, I've got, geez, you know, um, my experiment didn't work. I've got this job. So I, I had a tension between, you know, um, you know, my job at the steel mill, and then what I perceived as my, my failing business. And so attention doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, positive or negative, but it's a, it's a gap. It's a gap between what is or what could be, or maybe what is or what should be. And, um, and it's useful to frame your, your, your tension. You know, you want to look at your, you know, your circle of, of influence. Like, is it, 
Is it in your sphere? You know, are you the tension? You know, perhaps you had a emotional response that has led to an internal judgment. And of course that's, you know, something for, for you to, to deal with, to, to process. Or is the tension in your direct circle of influence? Is it, you know, within your, your team or your friends and, and family or, or hobbies perhaps? Um, you know, for example, if it's, a, if it's tension in your team, you know, this is, um, you know, what the strategic practice is for, you know, you can, you know, tensions could lead to new initiatives and new, new projects, new milestones, even, you know, new, like a new mission for the, for the team. And uh, as you start to draw, you know, a bigger circle, you know, uh, is the tension in an area you want to influence, you know, it could be uh, in, in the company, it could be in IQ metrics, or it could be in your community, or it could be um, in, you know, around, around the planet. But of course, you know, as we draw a bigger circle, our, our influence can shrink, but the framing helps you select a, a, a starting point. You know, for example, you could have an idea, you know, it's like, hey, maybe, you know, we could do this and it might not fit within your team and maybe in the company. And this is, this is what, for example, our red stapler um, process is, is for. It allows you to, you know, have, have avenues to pursue these, these ideas. Now, you know, in looking uh, at tensions and, and, you know, my experience with them, there's, um, there's uh, lots of pitfalls. One of the uh, uh, first ones is certainly just not, not speaking up. If you're, if you're feeling something, uh, you know, speak up. I shared yesterday the story about uh, humble confidence and that, that tension led to such a great discussion on strengthening a truth, like strengthening one of the values of, of, of ready. Now, this next one is a really, really big one. Uh, it's, you know, not processing tensions, you know, there's whole areas of, you know, psychology, you know, that dedicates itself to, to this area. Um, you know, unprocessed tensions, they don't go away, they can trap us in our own mind. And, and, and this, this is, this can lead to a, a victim or a blame mindset, you know, we've all been there, you know, I reflected in times when I've been, you know, both of these in, in a way I, I shouldn't have. Um, another one is cognitive bypassing. This is just when you ignore it, you know, it's there, but you just sort of skip over it, but it affects your mental state. And the, the next one is cognitive dissonance. This is, um, so rather than sort of deal with the attention, you know, it causes pain, you create a different story. And this story, you know, is made up really, it, it allows you, but it's not true. No, the story's not true. So again, it affects your, your reality. Um, and the last one uh, is like, like, where did this tension come from? Like, is it real? Is it, is it true? I, I was recently talking to a friend that was um, sharing with me their concerns over, over masks and how it had such a psychological impact. And uh, this individual had a child and thought it can do this to kids. And, and they were really concerned about this, this tension, you know, and they were almost victimized by this. And I proceeded to, to question them on this to try to understand like, where did this come from? And I realized that, you know, it wasn't a felt tension, you know, it wasn't something they had experienced themselves. It's something that they read about, you know, so we have to be careful and understand the source, um, you know, of our tensions. We don't want to become a victim of something that's, you know, not useful to become a victim of. So the frame helps determine the next step, step two. This is to, to ask, to seek to, to understand. Uh, I should have done more of this when, you know, at that point, because I was considering, you know, shutting down my business and I was not asking anybody. I was alone in my decision, except for my, my mother-in-law. She um, often reminded me of how her uncle started a business and, and, and went bankrupt. So I was in this bubble with my mother-in-law navigating uh, through this decision. Now, um, I wanna share with you a short story here about the uh, blind men and the elephant. There were 
six blind men who grew up in a village in India, and the community kept them safe and shared with them many stories. The men were curious about many of the stories they heard, but they were most curious about elephants. Based on the stories that each of them had heard, they argued about what elephants must be like. The community grew tired of these arguments and arranged for the men to visit the palace, where they were greeted by an old friend from their village who worked as a gardener on the palace grounds. Their friend led them to the courtyard. There stood an elephant. men stepped forward to touch the creature that was the subject of so many arguments. The first blind man reached out and touched the side of the huge animal. An elephant is smooth and solid like a wall, he declared. It must be very powerful. The second blind man put his hand on the elephant's limber trunk. An elephant is like a giant snake, he announced. The third blind man felt the elephant's pointed tusk. I was right, he decided. This creature is as sharp and deadly as a spear. The fourth blind man touched one of the elephant's four legs. What we have here, he said, is an extremely large cow. The fifth blind man felt the elephant's giant ear. I believe an elephant is like a huge fan, or maybe a magic carpet that can fly over mountains and treetops, he said. The sixth blind man gave a tug on the elephant's coarse tail. Why, this is nothing more than a piece of old rope. Dangerous indeed, he scoffed. The gardener led his friends to the shade of a tree. Sit here and rest for the long journey home, he said. I will bring you some water to drink. While they waited, the six blind men talked about the elephant. An elephant is like a wall, said the first blind man. Surely we can finally agree on that. A wall? An elephant is a giant snake, answered the second blind man. It's a spear, I tell you, insisted the third blind man. I'm certain it's a giant cow, said the fourth blind man. Magic carpet, there's no doubt, said the fifth blind man. Don't you see, pleaded the sixth blind man. Someone used a rope to trick us. Their argument continued and their shouts grew louder and louder. Wall, snake, spear, cow, carpet, rope. Stop shouting, called a very angry voice. It was the Raja, awakened from his nap by the noisy argument. How can each of you be so certain you are right? Asked the ruler. The six blind men considered the question. And then, knowing the Raja to be a very wise man, they decided to say nothing at all. The elephant is a very large animal, said the Raja kindly. Each man touched only one part. Perhaps if you put the parts together, you will see the truth. Now, let me finish my nap in peace. I love that story. Yeah, so the, the blind men shaped their decisions only from their own perspective, you know, and did not ask, did not seek to understand. So, so step two is to ask, you know, you know, look, maybe it's just ask yourself at Google or, you know, ask, get advice, seek somebody that has experience or perspective or somebody that is close to the tension. And some of the pitfalls here you know, first and foremost is not asking the right question. You know, that, that is really um, important to, to ask the right questions. And the second uh, pitfall that I've seen and, um, you know, fell into myself is, is also confirmation bias. And this is very much related to the first pitfall of not asking the right question. You know, a lot of times, you know, we, we have a hypothesis and we're seeking an answer. So we only ask questions that, confirm that answer. Okay, now over to step three, simulate. So I 
have arrived at my job uh, at the steel plant. It's early morning and I'm about to do the shift change. Uh, we always have a little discussion with uh, the person. I was, a, I was a welder at the time and uh, had a little discussion with the older fellow who was doing the same job as me. But at the same time, like my mind is running, you know, it's processing this, this, this tension. And uh, I remember staring into the, the distance and the garage door was open. And I, I you know, I see the, old, the older guy, you know, it's probably my age now, um, walking, you know, with his lunchbox, he had worked all night. And, and uh, you know, I had at that moment, uh, simulated my future, you know, I simulated my future. Um, if I stayed at, at the, at the steel mill. So what helped me at that time was figuring out what, you know, not to do, you know, and being comfortable with not having a clear path to success. So when you simulate, you know, you, you, when you ask, you're, you're building like a bit of a mind map and you know how and my, are my assumptions correct? But really it's about, you wanna simulate the future. What does success look like one, three, five years? What does failure look like? And, and run experiments, you know, you can daydream, um, even in, in software prototyping is a great tool. And finally, you know, it's, it's a visualization exercise. It's something that you, um, you know, you really want to sit with. And so, so a way you could look at this too, if ask is left brain, more logical, you know, uh, simulate is really a right brain uh, exercise. And so lots of pitfalls uh, here. And I've seen these in teams and myself and, and around. Uh, the first one uh, is the, the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is, um, this is when you believe you're smarter than, than others. Uh, we all know some people out there that have, you know, blind spots, right? Um, but at the same time, they could be really, really gifted in an area. And so this is why co-regulation is really important. This is where the team can really help. And, um, but this is certainly, you know, it leads, you know, it leads some people astray in decision-making. The next is selection bias. It's a subtle um, variant of, of uh, or it's a variant of, of confirmation bias, but this is when you only want to select, um, you know, data, um, you know, that fits your, your theory and you're not open to all the information. Uh, the next bias is what's called anchoring bias. And uh, this is, for some reason, you know, we place a lot of value on early information that we get. And uh, marketers know this, for example, um, they will often use an anchoring price. Like they want to get you to buy something. They'll, they'll put something at a higher price, knowing that you're not going to buy it, but it helps you justify your, your buying decision for, for the, the, the lower priced item. But this is, a, this is a, a bias that we will sometimes put a lot of weight to initial information and not consider the totality of, of information. Uh, now we've got the, the misinformation effect. This, this takes numerous variants. Um, you know, it could be false information. You know, right now we are in a, in a time when there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, misinformation out there. Um, also, we can, um, you know, sometimes uh, place fake information in ourselves, And so this is when your, your memory sometimes has been interfered with. So we have to really check ourselves and make sure that, you know, we've got um, information on what's true. And the final one is, you know, we've got our simulation, but you know, is there something missing? You know, we just, we just have the information there, but we have to start a step back and see if there is something potentially missing. So up to the final uh, step, step four. This is your decision quotient. So you have all the inf you have all the information now. Now it's time to look at the whole. So back to the steel mill. You know I was watching that um, you know older man walk away, and you know at that moment I had my decision quotient quotients. I had my map. You know my map was was clear. I knew that um, my path was to quit my job and even though I didn't have confidence in the success of my, my business, 
I knew that I needed to take that leap. And so that was, that was my uh, decision quotient. So the decision quotient is a combination of your, your rational mind and, and your emotional heart, you know, IQ plus EQ equals DQ, your decision quotient, or, um, uh, and yes, with, with every decision, you can get ice cream. <laughs> I want a blizzard. <laughs> okay, so one final story. I heard the story when I was quite young and it really made uh, a mark in me and it probably even shaped my perspective on, on, on decision-making. And, and it really does highlight uh, the process. So the story is, uh, is in World War II and the um, British, the Spitfires, they were losing uh, a lot of planes to the Luftwaffe and they needed to do something about it. So their tension was that a lot of planes were, were getting shot down. And so they gathered a whole bunch of data. They got, um, they figured out where's the plane getting shot and where can we, you know, and, and they came back and all the different engineering groups, they decided, okay, we can put, um, what we can do is put a hundred pounds of, of armor. And so they, they got back and they um, each simulated the problem and they got together and they were arguing about, you know, where to put the armor. And, you know, for example, um, you know, if the plane, you know, got shot in the gas tank, it could blow up the plane or if the pilot got shot, then it didn't matter. So, so they could not agree on a quotient. And at that time they uh, invited a systems thinker or one way you can look at a more refined, you know, simulator, a uh, step, step three. And he looked at the, uh, you know, at their simulation and looked at the, the data and he very quickly said, oh, okay, well, this is where you put the armor. And the teams were really surprised because the data that they had, you know, pointed that this was not only a, um, no, this was actually not a good place. It wasn't even the right place. They, you know, it's, it's not the right place to put the armor. And so they, they questioned him on it and, uh, and he said, well, you know, the data that you had of the, where the plane was getting shot were only from planes that had come back. And um, so he discovered, you know, some, some, you know, we challenged the assumptions and he discovered, you know, something, uh, you know, some missing importance, <laughs> very important um, missing information. And uh, I was actually, this is one thing I just uh, was thinking about a minute before, um, you know, assumption too, like it's, it's obviously complex. And, you know, when there's a leader involved in a decision, you know, they're, they're a variable. And, um, you know, in, you want to look at a decision in, you know, even a, how a leader's character can affect that decision ongoing. So, so some of your assumptions can even be people involved uh, in, in the decision. So how will you succeed? Uh, you know, you need to own your decisions, you know, as an individual, as a team, you need to take ownership and you need to feel the decision. You know, it's like attention, it should have a vibrational energy uh, to it and take your decision to task. So some final, uh, thoughts on the idea. Uh, you know, one thing you can look at is, is the decision above the waterline or below the waterline? You know, if it's above the waterline, just do it. It's not going to do damage. It's not going to sink the boat. If it's below the water, if it'll do harm, you want to make sure that you are extra diligent in the process and, you know, ask more advice, especially when you are wanting to take a decision forward, you know, who has, who is it going to impact? And, and that final diligence is really important. You know, and when I reflected on that decision again of, of quitting my job, when I first was walking, you know, I was below water that, you know, and uh, my decision, you know, actually flipped and, um, you know, staying at the steel mill, which, which was above the water line actually was below the water line because I knew, you know, that that wasn't, you know, when I, future cast that that wasn't my path. And 
next is to make a decision, even if it's to do nothing, you know, the blue pill, it's just important to make it. As Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. Of course, I like to take the red pill. <laughs> and you are going to make mistakes. You know, ultimately progression in life is about producing failure. We only really progress through a series of regulated errors. You know, you have an aim and you, you know, feedback, learn, adjust, you know, every move is a partial failure, you know, to be corrected by the next one, you know, think of, um, you know, like a, a child learning to walk, you know, just progressive failures until they learn to walk. Um, I want to uh, share a verse from this poem, you know, uh, Robert Frost, uh, The Road Not Taken. I, I love this, this poem. But I think the real important point here is that sometimes the right path is the one less traveled by. And this can, can take courage because sometimes we're looking, you know, we want kind of the, the clear, the proven, you know, the one that, that we can see. And, and sometimes decisions in life really um, aren't going to give us that. And so remember that every positive change in your life begins with a clear, unequivocal decision to either that you are either going to do something or stop doing something. So to close, you can't make progress without making decisions. So claim agency, claim your sovereignty, increase your circle of influence and impact on your life. And that is our new task decision-making process. So now I think we can open it up for questions. Yes, 30 minutes. So we've got time for questions and I can have some more coffee. Well, uh, people are thinking through their questions, Chris. I'm going to lob something up at you in the, um, I'm allowed to do that, right? Yeah, of course. Okay, good. Sometimes I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak. Hey, yo, I'm always talking. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet. Uh, in the ask stage, you mentioned something about um, the part about um, asking the right questions. And, and what are, what are some of the, I have a couple of thoughts on this, but what are some of the suggestions you have for people to help them determine whether they, in fact they are asking the right questions? How do, they, how do they develop some sense of certainty? Not necessarily that we were completely certain, but some confidence around that we are in fact asking the right questions. You know, Scott, you are um, one of, like in our team, you're probably the best uh, individual of asking questions, but I would say, um, uh, I'll say one thing and then I want to throw it back to you. You, I think your, your beginning state, you know, cultivating curiosity. So when you are really, really open, you may not have, um, you know, the right question, but when you just start poking at it, your right question will actually be more of an emergent process of the exploration. So it may not be there at the very beginning, but, you know, just having the right state of mind. And I talked about some of those biases. This it's, it's really, really important to catch yourself. This is not a small, small issue, but, you know, confirmation bias is a big issue problem like i've i've had um you know like how many times everybody knows somebody that is comes and asks you for advice but they're just looking for you to confirm what they already know and they're just looking for an accomplishment accomplice in their idea and that's okay too but it's not useful and they're not going to get more information so the biases are are really important so the curiosity helps really i think open that that spectrum uh, up. So I think that's a really, you know, important part is just, just remain super curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. I, the, the thing that's interesting about that stage, about the asking questions, it is a definite stage, but it's, it, it actually carries all the way through. You're, you're constantly testing that hypothesis, sorry, not even when you're in the simulate stage, you're still testing the hypothesis at that point, that there's a series of questions that still comes in at, to play at that point. The, yes, um, I, I like the part about I I I answered my question on my notebook. <laughs> it's, it's easy, we're gonna. I thought, yeah, he just might spin this back on me. So um, one of the things, just to build on what you're saying about 
examining the tension itself. And one of the things that I like to do is um, if I describe the tension to someone that I'm feeling, and then I ask them for their response to that tension. And I find that often really helps me because they start asking me questions that triggers additional questions back. So, so it's not like I'm sitting there in a, in a room by myself trying to generate all the questions and they'll go ask, but rather I see it as an iterative process where you're kind of building off of, you share the tension with others, and then you start to ask your questions from there. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I noticed there was one, one question that came in, but I, before we get to uh, Joanne is asking about, is this going to replace um, the dis integrated decision-making process in the IQOS? Uh, maybe we should just uh, tackle that right now, Chris. Yeah, yeah. The, there's still like, if you want to use the formal, like bringing a proposal to the group, to your team, you know, that portion, but yes, this will replace the integrated decision-making process. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We, I think some of the feedback that we've had from people on the integrated decision making process is that, um, although, although useful, there are a lot of steps um, and there's some complexity that comes into it. The hope, I think, when we look at this is that, first off, it's pretty easy to remember. And it, it does require that taking action piece, going out and getting information, bringing it back in, and then thinking through what the applications are. So I, I'm sure that we're gonna build the practice of getting better at this, but in terms of uh, simplicity in comparison to the current process, it's, it's much easier to, to grasp and comprehend. There's a question here from Vic. Uh, in my opinion, we make a lot of our decisions unconsciously. No. I think some of us may even make all of our decisions without even realizing we are making, we are decision making. How can we get better at noticing when we are in a moment that this process would be applicable. So how do yeah. we know, how do we know that we should be using this process? Yeah, well, we, we do, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of pre pre-programming. I, I shared yesterday how um, I deleted, you know, so many, all the social media and everything off my phone because I found when I had a moment, I was like going back and so, this is where, you know, reflection and looking, you know, backwards and seeing, you know, looking at your habits, looking at your day, you know, and seeing, you can see those unconscious responses. Um, so reflection, I would say, is one part of that. The next part of it is, um, and, and this requires sometimes, uh, you know, this requires trust and, and your home team should be a safe place. You know, it takes time to build that trust, but we all can help each other in our own blind spots. Uh, the, the term that I like to use is co-regulate. You know, when we see some sort of unconscious behavior come up and it can come up in a team environment, you know, we can, you know, feel safe to, to bring it up. And so if we don't discover it in our own reflection, you know, somebody close to us, you know, can, can bring it up. And that's how we work together to evolve, you know, in, in being able to, you know, work through these un unconscious uh, type of behaviors. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Vic, for the question. You keep throwing the questions into uh, the chat box, and I'll do my best to moderate those. Um, one of the things, Chris, that um, when I, when I think about um, when I think about IQers, one of the, the the things I love is the level of diversity that we have. And within that diversity, we all sense tensions in different ways. And so I'm wondering if maybe you could share a little bit because you're, you're particularly good at diagnosing that first off, recognizing you have a tension and then diagnosing what is that tension. What are the ways that you do that? Because so often we're so busy, we've got so many things going on and, you're, and you constantly have stuff throwing out, well, not you anymore, you cut off all your social media, but, but you have things thrown at you all the time. And we often just keep, running down the path how do you get yourself to pause to reflect well wait a second there's a tension here what do you do well tensions like i say you you, you feel them uh though there's um uh one 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 thing i can tell you is i i found um let's just kind of make an imaginary scale of like you know one to ten on the level of tension you're just feeling and um 
So if I'm having a day where I'm an eight or a nine, like I'm already up there, you know, a, a level two tension can like throw me over the top. So it's really, you know, this is where like morning practice, um, whatever exercise is going for a walk, it's really to, you know, know where you're at, you know, and if you are like, can be at a two or a three or a five, you know, a two or a five, you know, you can better process that tension. Cause as we know, when we get to fight or flight, our mental capacity, like we lose, you know, we are in an emotional response and we lose our ability to reason. So it's really important to try to regulate. Now, if I did feel a tension that, you know, was strong and I was high, you know, I generally give that space and so that I can actually, uh, you know, reason with it and not, not react, you know, in the moment. But mm. that, that's one part, you know, um, do, and uh, if anybody else wants to add uh, something to that, please, please chime in. Any, any other comments on how to recognize tension? But yeah, you feel it, you know, and we have to be careful that like, just circle it right <laughs> circle yeah. that tension and uh, like is this is this real um and you know choose like we we have to be really careful to not you know get drawn into things that aren't useful you know right like yes. if it's not useful you know you want to sort of deal with it and you know for some people for example climate change could be real concerning um but to go into the pain of it, and, and, and you may need to go there and, and mourn, but to stay there is not healthy. You need to do something. And like, so what I've done with things, like I do have some things that are, are bothering me, like the, um, for example, our information ontology is broken. And I, I joined, I, I'm helping um, a friend, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger is his name. He's a really interesting thinker. He has this project called the Consilience Project. So I've been volunteering my time in helping fix this information ontology. So we've got a small team and we're launching in a few months, um, you know, a, a, a high signal, low noise news source. And so, so I see all this is broken. What do I do? And just the fact that I can do something, even if it's small, it helps me deal with that dissidence, that, that pain. Mm. I mean, um, I'm going to go to Andrew. I'm going to tee up here in just a moment. One of the things that I think you do really well, but a lot of us fail to properly do is build some time in for reflective thinking. <laughs> and it's easy to allow our calendars to build up so that there's no, no slack in them. And before you know it, your energy is drained from a whole series of meetings and the chance to do the reflective thinking is gone. I encourage people, uh, some of my colleagues lately have been, um, and I know a number of you already do this, but actually blocking off time in their calendars to do that reflective thinking, making sure that they have that time in order to examine the issues that are in front of them and properly determine what, whether it should be following the task process or not. So I encourage you to do that. Andrew, why don't we, we turn to you um, and, and you can throw out your question. Sure, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I was just kind of thinking back to that, that first, well, not slide, I suppose, because I like your, uh, your transitions there. That was pretty smooth. But um, how it showed the, the T, A, S, and Q in the loop. And uh, that made me think of iteration. And, um, but I guess I'm not quite grasping exactly where the iterative aspects come in. How does the, the quotient then lead back into the tension? Or maybe I'm misinterpreting that. And so I was just wondering if you might be able to expand on that. Uh, where yeah. do you see the iterative qualities in there? It, iteration is the, and, and, and you're right, you know, you may not make a decision and it's going to go back to the tension and it's loop. It is an entire circle, but the, the important thing is to, to make a choice and the choice would be, you know, putting something off to the side, but there's room for spontaneity and um, iterative in, in all aspects, um, you know, of, of the process. Um, the, and the decision too, like if you decide um, that you want to take something forward, you know, depending on the kind of decision, you know, some decisions are binary, some decisions are big and long. So this, um, I wanted to make it very universal uh, at the base level, but you can think of a decision like a seed, you know, 
you've got the DNA of the idea in the seed. And it's like, you've got this hypothesis or actually it should be a theory. So the difference between a hypothesis and theory is hypothesis isn't really thought through or proven out. Certainly scientifically, they use this term a theory. You've already, you've got a lot of information. So you have more confidence. In it. So you've got this theory around this decision, but you know, then you got to grow. And that's where, you know, like, for example, we use the IQOS scaffolding. It's not the actual, we don't expect that it's going to turn out exactly like it is, but we want to aim it at a direction. So that theory is in the seed and we grow and then we adjust uh, along the way. So the iterative side is, you know, when like, and this is a concept of self-management, you know, you sense the world, you know, you, you have something happens and then you sense, adjust, learn, and then you integrate that back into the process. So this is where owning the decision really matters. And, and this is like a, another important principle, like sometimes you want to influence a decision, like sometimes you might have a tension. It could be a tension about the company. It's like, well, what is happening here? You know, go through that process. You can actually help inform it. Maybe you have new information or information that they don't have, or it can help you get a better understanding, which can allow you to be better uh, strategists within your own team. And, and so it's always, um, you know, I guess in, important to um, you know to process that, but yeah, I just think I can I can go on, but I'll I'll leave it at that and <laughs> leave it for more I questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, awesome. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Dean L is asking, what is your vision for how task ties into self management? What are the specific linkages, maybe? Yeah, I, you know, everybody will 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 use it. Um, you know, in their own own way. I know I just wanted to highlight some really fundamental steps that are, are, are quite important, you know, and, and again, they were mistakes that I've made in looking back in areas that, that, that I've seen, but we all need to be, you know, decisions are how we move forward. So we, we need to, and this is like, whether it be decisions in ourselves. I feel that if we can be better at, you know, managing oneself, you know, we can be better to help our team and help our communities and help the companies. So, so I've um, really felt that decision making, this process, this understanding, this is a real skill that we all need to get better at, and it's one of the most important processes. So, for example, uh, how it gets used within self management within the strategic practice when we meet monthly to zoom out and say, okay, this is, um, you know what is happening and you know there's new ideas or issues that need to be dealt with and you know the decision making process should be you know can be utilized to make better decisions and uh, uh, but yeah I think it's it's integral so it can work with you know work at all levels uh, in the organization the um, uh, and I just if, if, sorry just to build on that a little bit one of the areas that um, we're trying to improve on is as a business is on the collaboration front. And once again, to, not to, a shameless plug for the session tomorrow morning on collaboration, mm -hmm. strongly encourage you guys to go. But the task uh, uh, process itself lends itself to, the task process itself lends itself, too many itself, ties in very nicely into helping us improve on the collaboration piece. That by the very nature of identifying the tension, and then going into the ask stage. And then the simulation is not necessarily sitting in a room by yourself once again, but it's it can involve so many others to reach the quotient. And of course, everybody knows that the decisions that involve where you bring in other people, their sense of connection and ownership to it is much higher. So the task process ties very nicely to an area that we have to improve on as, in a business, and that's collaboration between teams. So um, I think it fits very well within the self-management uh, piece for that. What I, for yeah. That reason. yeah. And I just add to that, the, you know, tensions between teams, so important to, to figure it out, you know, you could have a tension and, and it can actually lead to big issues on how teams, you know, kind of co-regulate and, and, you know, collectively create something together. So uh, very important um, to, to address that. Um, uh, other questions, uh, if I got them all, oh, Will's asking where you can get the red pills. Um, Kova clients have red gummies. Um, that's a, it, it, the, there you go, Will. Um, you're welcome. Uh, any, uh, have I missed any in here? 
I just wanted maybe, you know, the, the, the red pill, uh, maybe think of the red stapler. Uh, and the interesting thing is, you know, we made a decision around a process, not knowing what kind of outcome. So it's interesting to see, like, you make a decision and all of a sudden it can open up or close a set of possibilities. And so this is an example where a small decision can have quite big implications, right? So we made a decision. We're going to open this up. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, we didn't know five years ago, we didn't know COVID would exist. We didn't know ready would exist. No idea. But we opened a door. And, and so that's an example where small decisions can have this like really interesting effect. And so there's a lot of nuance, um, you know, in that. And we see it in our own lives too. I remember... Uh, I remember sending a link to my my eldest daughter who's now engaged. Uh, hey, you should check out this eco thing in Panama. Next thing you know, she's there, meets a guy. They're getting married. I mean, it's just like, whoa, what did I do here? <laughs> just a simple little email, you know, changes lives forever. <laughs> but again, it opens it opens possibilities. It you know, and so that's a really you know our choices can, you know, open or close certain things. And so we, you know, we want to, of course, remain open to good possibilities. And so it's a consideration in the choices we make. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions, open it up the floor to, and you can just unmute and, and lob, lob it up verbally or... Um, as I understood it, the queue of task Evolves around integrating different kinds of intelligence and taking a next step. Did I get the point? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that 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 would be a good way. You know, it's your 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 quotient. You know, it's a obviously a play off of IQ and EQ and you know IQ metrics, right? Um, but it's something that you you hold and your quotient is going to evolve in time. You know, it's going to be informed, but you know, it, it's really represents like kind of a, a totality of, you know, your rational mind and your emotional mind. And, and um, so, so yeah. And so like, for example, one of the points that I had at the end of the quotient is like, if you have an idea, you know, like, but if you're not feeling it, you know, um, like the emotional energy associated like with your heart, you know, really can matter in, in your choices. And so, um, you know, there's to, to, to fill out a decision, especially an important decision, there's, you know, lots of things to consider. One of the things that um, this will hopefully be able to do is clarify steps for people. Uh, all too often, a decision can seem quite, quite daunting. And, and so, and we can be overwhelmed by that. And so there, what this provides us is a methodology to kind of simplify the process and, and have some clarity around how we can take some steps or when those big decisions, but so often even with the small decisions, we just leap to something and, it, and we haven't really necessarily followed the process. And even the small things have huge ramifications before you know it, Chris's daughter's getting married. So mm -hmm. we gotta, you know, it's having that, those formal steps really does help in, hopefully improve the quality of decisions that we're making as well. Uh, and my my attempt on that too was to really you know keep it at a really fundamental like almost principle based level you know a lot of uh, decision making processes are quite machine like you know identify the problem and there's like seven steps and you know you read the seven steps and you forget about them because it's uh, you know like they they can fit for some decisions but but not all and and sometimes like you know I want to draw a bigger circle and because uh, of course some tensions like they're they're um, they're going to be a closed loop, right? Like, and it's still a decision though. Like if you have an emotional response to something, you know, it could be your, your partner, your spouse, something they do bothers you, right? It's like, oh, I hate when they do that. Well, that's you, you know, that's your ego. Like you make, you can make a decision to let that bother you. And then you're going to project it onto your partner or you can just like, oh, that's just my stupid ego story. I maybe should stop that. Right. Um, so like the decisions, like it, they, they do lead to a decision but you know i so i really wanted to look at this in its totality and you know and i just found that you know these steps are and and again depending on like the problem area you, you might want to go and pull like a, there might be there are some very specific tools that might be useful that are quite tactical in nature um you know getting to a technical problem for example but this is really 
you know, my, my intent was something really uh, universal at a, at a, at a more, um, you know, holistic level. And, you know, one of the principles of self-management, and, and again, we, I looked at all the decision-making process, they're all narrow, but, you know, self-management, uh, one of the, the principles is, is wholeness, right? This idea of wholeness. And so I, I wanted this, you know, and I feel like this is so, so important. If we could be, you know, better at making decisions for ourselves and, and, you know, within the organization, it, it has, um, and within the world, it can uh, have big, you know, has big implications. Cool. Well, actually with that, uh, I don't see any other questions coming in. And that is, that is a pretty darn good close. Um, unless there is any additional questions. Let's see any hand raised. Got another one I could throw out. You just made me curious about something, sure. actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. uh, existing frameworks like SWOT, for instance. Um, sure, you're familiar with that uh, that four-letter acronym. Um, yeah, yeah. That's an example this? of a great tool that you can use to, you know, in the ask question, right? You know, that's a great tool. Um, in fact, we could put that in. You know, like I, I, um, I would think that's probably a good idea to put that into like a, a deeper framework so that like for depending on what it is it could be a really really great tool for those of you who don't know SWAT it's strengths weaknesses opportunities threats so it's a good way to assess a uh, 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 attention or an idea uh, and Andrew you where are you going with that <laughs> oh no he, he was uh on the ball and answered my question before <laughs> I got it out <laughs> yeah that was exactly what I was thinking is how do those existing tools do you see them you know this this um kind of wrapping it all up integrating those tools in into the various stages or is a replacement and I kind of suspected the answer but I I yeah, wanted to yeah, hear your the, thoughts on that yeah, the, the tool is just like, you know, it's like you go to the the tool cabinet and there's a whole bunch of tools there and you can decide, you know, what to use. Uh, but you're right, that's probably a really good tool to have, um, you know, to, to, to have on the shelf for people. And I know that uh, IQU helps facilitate SWAT uh, sessions too. So you can even call on them to help you uh, in your team process that. Uh, Jeff Wall is, uh, is an expert at uh, facilitating it. He's probably the most most talented in the group of, of managing that process. Uh, Dean L's got a fantastic question here. Uh, what happens when a team makes the right decision, but someone blocks it further down the line? How do you reset? <laughs> that is a, another tension. That's like co-regulation. That is getting together. Now, I mean, if you made a decision, you know, within your circle of influence, if it's in your team, you know, typically you, you should have the agency to make decisions there. But, you know, we sometimes will make decisions that have bigger implications. And sometimes we haven't gone through the right process of getting the feedback, like who is affected by this decision, right? Do we have all the information? So the tension could be from a simple fact of like, whoa, whoa, do we have, you know, have we considered everything here? Um, so this is why the process is really important. So that's where the framing comes in. You know, if it's just in your area and, and you've seek you've seeked people that get perspective, you seek people that have expertise. Um, you know, uh, you should be able to make that decision. But if it has implications, like again below the waterline, especially, then you know you're gonna you know a new tension to come in. But I think we need to remain flexible that. We all want to work towards this, and and sometimes the boundaries are not clear, um, you know, around this. Like we, so you know, but I think the thing is, make the decision, and uh, we we learn from the mistakes. So by making the decision, and if somebody you now blocking it shouldn't be like it's like it's like whoa whoa whoa, I have a tension with this decision. Let's now iterate again and find out and inform and even make a better decision. So like the, the idea is to, to not, because like self-management is not about control, right? You know, holding information control, it's really, you know, allowing that, um, you know, teams to be semi-autonomous in, in their work. And, um, you know, it's very inefficient to have a whole bunch of control lines and linkages uh, in how information flows and how decisions are made. So. Um, but, but it is a learning process, you know, the, you can think of your agency and your team's agency like a circle. And as you claim more agency, that circle expands, or as an individual claims more agency, their circle of impact and influence expands. And that could be uh, sometimes not even just within their team. Maybe they're on certain gig teams. They have an idea. I'm on this gig team, that gig team. 
Um, you know, I'm also really helping out these other teams and co-regulating. So, so as we claim more agency, get more involved, we will increase our, our circle of um, influence. And therefore, you know, you claim more agency. And agency is just the ability to, to make the decision. That was a great question. Thanks, Dean. Um, and you did pretty good as well, Chris, with the answer. Uh, <laughs> I was really good. I've been thinking about this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, hey? Maybe a lot. Uh, it's a really, it's such an important issue. And, and the, the capacity to tackle these things will hopefully help us unblock that we will be able to properly reset and get decisions made in a more timely manner. I think Marty mentioned yesterday, which I thought was a great point in the self-management piece and how that has slowed us down to a certain degree. But as we get better at the practice, it should accelerate us um, and really be able to embrace that speed and agility value that we have within our corporate values. I think with, I think with that, we're, we're hit our, we hit our time. Um, uh, but I know, Chris, if you'll want to hear from people if they have uh, thoughts, ideas, um, so if you've got some perspective on this, uh, I know Chris is really interested in hearing from you on that. Uh, if you're wanting clarification on things, you can you can poke any one of us. Uh, IQU will be working actively working within this framework. So uh, we will also be able to assist. So this is just the introduction of it. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward to grasp. The application was gonna take some practice. So uh, with that, uh, Chris, thank you so much. And yeah, thank, thank you everybody for attending. You guys Great enjoy the rest guys. of your day. You take Bye. care. I know.